As we start this conversation, let's begin by taking a look at what are some of the similarities that we have between a data center network and a network that maybe exists in the campus, but then also start to look at some of the differences. Some of these technologies that we're going to leverage, VPCs and VDCs and VXLAN, all these protocols that seem to start with the letter V for some reason, and not for some reason, the word virtual is kind of important inside the data center, and so we get a lot of Vs. But either way, outside of all of that, we want to take a look at this and we want to see uh, maybe have a bit of a topology conversation as well and start that off before we dive into more details on the Leaf Spine architecture in the next video. For now, let's jump in. A data center network is certainly going to be different than how we build networks outside of the data center. However, let's start by talking about the similarities. First of all, we are still going to be building these networks on switches. And even though we don't get a whole lot of routers in the data center environment, we might see uh, depending on if we our core exists inside the data center, we might still see some edge routers and firewalls and such. But as far as the data center network itself is concerned, we're going to primarily build this out on switches, just like we do in the campus environment. Now, we are still going to be connecting to edge devices. At the edge, we're not really talking about phones and PCs and printers and wireless access points anymore. Instead, we are talking about servers and appliances and storage devices. But as part of this, we're going to use a lot of traditional constructs. We're still going to be using VLANs, for example, and IP networking. None of that changes. We're still building this on Ethernet and IP networks. As such, we can expect to see a lot of the same Layer 3 services inside of a data center that we're used to seeing in the campus. We're still going to see default gateways deployed, for example. In a lot of cases, we'll see first-hop redundancy protocols to help us keep those gateways online. We're also going to see some routing protocols deployed into the data center. In small and medium data centers, we're probably just going to integrate, for example, OSPF or EIGRP into the existing environment. However, in larger data centers, we might see us deploy BGP or ISIS, something with a little bit more scale to really get the routing deployed throughout the environment. And so ultimately, what we're saying here is that we're still deploying our network on switches, we're still deploying layer 2 to the edge, we're still deploying layer 3 routing and integrating that into the network core, uh, data center networking is not like we're landing on an alien planet here. We are still doing Ethernet and IP networking, and so we can apply a lot of the same concepts to data center. Even though, yes, it will look a little bit different, so let's talk about some of those differences. One very important quality of a data center network is the ability to scale out at layer 2. Scaling out at layer 2 is a big no-no over here in the campus environment. We don't want to extend layer 2 between our buildings, for example, if we have multiple buildings in a campus, we usually want to have that layer 3 separated. However, inside the data center, we want as much layer 2 as possible. And the reason for that is because we want the ability to migrate a lot of our different workloads. That might be a virtual machine, it might be something in the storage world. And speaking of which, a lot of our storage traffic, if it's Ethernet and IP driven, this needs to be layer 2 as well. And lastly, when we think about multi-tenancy. For a lot of us, we're going to be working with organizations where we are the only tenant inside of our own data center. It's our data center, it's our servers. However, if we do work for a service provider and we're deploying multi-tenancy into our infrastructure, then we need the ability to deploy a client's virtual machines wherever we want. We can't necessarily be locked down to saying, hey, this virtual machine has to live on this specific server because we have layer two adjacency problems. We need the ability to scale layer two everywhere so that we can deploy a client's virtual machines wherever it makes sense for us. And so we need as much flexibility in this space and ultimately that's what layer two brings. Layer two brings flexibility. We can deploy anything wherever we want, whenever we want. That's the joy of layer two. Now the problem with layer two is that it comes with some nastiness. It comes for example with our requirement to deploy something like spanning tree protocol because we need to block all of the different loops that are formed at layer two. Furthermore, we have to worry about broadcast domains. And so we need to be careful about the amount of broadcasts that develop inside of our data center. And something else that we don't usually need to worry about outside the data center is the number of MAC addresses in our environment. I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time sometimes looking at data sheets and taking a look at how big is the CAM table? How big is the TCAM space? Because data center switches need to learn a whole lot more MAC addresses than we typically need to learn. And so we need to inject some intelligence around how we learn MAC addresses, but we'd rather, really rather contain our MAC address learning where possible. Now, in addition to scaling at layer two, we have a lot of different technologies at place inside the data center that we don't need outside of the data center. A lot of this has to do with scaling at layer two. So for example, we've got virtual port channels. We use virtual port channels inside the data center instead of technology like stacking, as well as VSS. 
We're not going to use either of those inside the data center because we have virtual port channels and there's some really good reasons for why we deploy virtual port channels instead. Furthermore, we want to get rid of spanning tree protocol, which is definitely the dream of Ethernet, but how are we going to go about doing that? In a lot of cases, we're going to deploy VXLAN and VXLAN is going to require a control plane protocol in most cases. And so we might deploy EVPN, we might deploy ACI and that'll take care of it for us. But either way, once again, we have to address some of these downsides, one of which is spanning tree protocol. Another technology that can help with STP would be the fabric extenders. We can extend the fabric of a Nexus switch by deploying a FEX, a Nexus 2K. And this FEX is not capable of switching. It's, it can't bring a packet in, for example, on one interface and send it back out a different interface on its own device. It's not capable of doing that because it doesn't have cam space. It's not storing any of that information. It says it's going to send that traffic up to the parent and get it back. And it will, the parent essentially tells the FEX which interface to send it out. Now in the data center space, we also need to worry about storage. And so we've got technologies like Fiber Channel and FCOE in here. We also need to worry about IP-based storage. So we've got iSCSI in the mix. And all of these protocols require a lot of attention for keeping them online and functional and making sure that we're not dropping too much storage traffic because dropping storage traffic is a big problem inside the data center. So we have to prevent that at all costs. Incidentally, by the way, bandwidth is kind of a big deal inside the data center. 10 gig is typically the minimum that we want to extend down to our servers and appliances. And these days, we typically want to deploy 25 gig if that's possible. And Cisco has made it really cost effective to deploy 40 gig and even, yes, 100 gig into our data centers. The industry has given us new form factors like SFP28, which gives us up to 25 gig on SFP form factor, but then also we have QSFP28. And QSFP28 is going to give us this 40 gig and 100 gig and once again, it's very cost effective relative to how much we just have to pay for these larger bandwidth links. And lastly, redundancy is a really big deal. We do not want any of our data center equipment to go down and that includes our network switches. And furthermore, if one of our switches does go down, we need to get back online very, very quickly by redirecting out redundant paths. And so first of all, we wanna worry about device resiliency. So for example, we've got dual power supplies in pretty much every Nexus device we could possibly deploy. Furthermore, NXOS itself is a modular operating system. NXOS, what we deploy onto Nexus switches instead of iOS, it's going to feel a whole lot like iOS, but at the same time, it is a little bit different. But one of the primary reasons we deploy NXOS is because it's a modular, more resilient operating system. If you've been on a Nexus switch, you're probably familiar with this feature command. You may have always wondered, why do we have these feature commands? If I want to configure OSPF, for example, I don't even have access to OSPF commands until I enable the OSPF feature. Why is that? Well, because in the iOS world, we had to run the OSPF process constantly just in case we decided to turn OSPF on. And in a lot of cases, we might just be running EIGRP and we're never going to turn OSPF on. And yet the process is running in iOS and there's a risk at any given time that the OSPF process could crash and take down the switch. And it's not just OSPF, there are dozens of processes that are running in iOS, all of which might end up taking the switch down if there's a process problem, maybe it crashes and takes down the switch with it. And so with NXOS, we don't want any of those features running if we're not actually using them. And so this is where the feature command comes in, we enable it, we say, okay, we do wanna fire that process up, and now we gain access to the configuration commands and can turn that process on. Incidentally, just to conclude the technology section, by the way, you'll notice one technology that we do not have in here is power over ethernet. We are typically not deploying down to phones or possibly Wi-Fi access points. We don't need these devices inside of the data center in most cases. Yeah, every now and again, we might need a single phone so that somebody could call out of the data center if they're in there, but that's fine. We can plug that phone into the wall and we don't typically do that, but it can work for a one-off. Same with access points, by the way. We can plug an access point into the wall if we want some wireless there. And so we're not going to provide PoE with the data center switches. Instead, we're going to rely on either hard cabling it into the wall or possibly having some kind of network closet nearby that will provide PoE for the devices that we need. So we are ready to deploy a bunch of Nexus switches into the data center. What exactly do our topologies look like inside of these environments? Well, data centers can look a lot like the campus. The campus is built on a multi-tiered architecture, usually a three-tier architecture. Maybe we're going to collapse a layer or two in there, but either way, what we typically have is a core layer and then a distribution layer, and then we're going to connect into the access layer and our clients all hang off of the access layer. The distribution layer connects down to a bunch of different access layers. And so this is designed to modularly scale our campus environments. 
on the data center side, we could do the same thing. We could actually connect into the core layer, have a distribution layer here. Now in the data center space, we typically call our distribution layers the aggregation layer. So I'll throw aggregation in there. And so now we've got a pair of aggregation switches. We're doing layer three to the core. And now we're going to do layer two down to the access layer. We still do have an access layer in the data center. So we call it differently at the distribution layer, but for some reason we still call it the data center access layer. That's fine. And we connect to a bunch of devices. And once again, these devices are going to be servers and storage and whatnot. So we could deploy our data centers this way. In fact, this is the traditional way of deploying data center topologies. However, there is a more modern way of deploying data centers, and that would be known as the spine leaf topology. At first glance, spine leaf is going to look a lot like our traditional architecture. Because, for example, we could deploy two spine switches, and then we're going to connect those down to leaf switches. So let's just say we've got four leaf switches in here. Now, one of the key differences is we're not going to connect our spine switches to other spine switches. Instead, spines connect to leaf switches, and that's it. We're not connecting leaf switches to leaf switches either. Furthermore, the role of the spine switch is not to be an aggregation level switch. We're not running first hop redundancy protocols and gateways and other intelligence. In fact, a lot of the intelligence resides at the leaf layer. So instead, what we're going to do is we're actually going to bring the core of the network into a leaf switch, have this still be a layer three connection, and then the entire data center is hanging off of the leaf spine architecture. Furthermore, these connections in here are layer three, except we already said that we need to scale out at layer two. And so what we're going to do here is use a technology like VXLAN to tunnel between our leaf switches. We're going to see a whole lot more about spine and leaf in the next video, but for now, just understand that it is the more modern way of deploying data center architectures. So as we can see here, data center to architectures, they're nothing to be afraid of here. We're still building them on ethernet. We're still building them on IP. We're still building them on network switches. It's going to feel very familiar from that perspective. However, they do have a different focus. They're focused on these data center technologies. We've got to think about things like virtual port channels and VXLAN. We have to think about the fact that we don't want spanning tree everywhere. We need to scale out at layer two. So it is a little bit different. Now, when it comes to our topologies, we saw that we can build it on the traditional three-tier architecture, or we can build it on spine and leaf. And so let's go ahead and dive in a little bit more detail into spine and leaf and see how exactly we build those types of architectures. I hope this has been informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click here to subscribe to CBT Nuggets and click the notification bell to make sure that you're aware of every time we post new content. If you're interested in a career in IT or you want to brush up on your IT skills, then swing over to our website and while you're there, be sure to sign up for a free trial.